Hey guys, this is John, and welcome to another episode of Chess Cognition. And in this example, I'm facing Grandmaster Irina Crush. This is a game I played against her in 2013 at the St. Louis Classic. I actually made a Grandmaster Norm in this tournament. It was one of the best tournaments I've ever had. And we pick up the game right after my 38th move. And it was Crush's turn to move, and she played Queen C4. So my question to you is, how should I respond to Queen C4? If you'd like to pause and calculate a line, you could do so now. Okay, so one thing we notice about this position right off the bat, aside from counting the material, which is something you always want to do when assessing a position on the fly, just count the material. In this case, the material is equal. But one thing we should notice is that there's a huge difference in king safety in this position. Uh, Black's king is nicely tucked away behind these pawns. I can always escape to h7 if white checks me on the back rank. However, white's king is a little bit drafty. Uh, white has already moved the h and the g pawns, and you can see it particularly along the second rank, the white king is exposed. And my bishop that's sitting on e4 has a nice avenue into white's position, it has nice scope along those light squares. So trading queens here with a move like queen takes c4 for black would not be a good decision because after bishop takes c4, it's unlikely that black would be able to exploit the weakened nature of white's king. That white lets white off the hook a little bit. Um, this is now an equal end game, perhaps even one that's slightly better for white because they have a bit more space. So the first thing to realize is that we do not want to trade queens if we're black and we're hoping to maximize our chances here. In the game, the line that I first looked at in this position was queen f3. So queen f3 seems to make sense because it creates a queen bishop battery and I have two big threats, queen g2 checkmate and also queen h1 checkmate. Unfortunately, white can respond with queen f1, bringing the queen right back to the square from which it came. And it's defended by the bishop on b5 and it secures the g2 and h1 squares in retreating here. And black has no follow-up in this position. But instead of playing queen f3, I can play the move queen d1, which is what I decided upon in the game. This is a nice move. So in playing queen d1, we threaten queen h1 checkmate, but we also take an eye on that bishop on d4. So if white were to respond with the same move that worked in the previous line, which is queen f1, pairing the threat of queen h1 checkmate, they would lose the bishop on d4, black would be up a piece, and I would be winning. So that means that white's hand is forced after queen d1. They must play bishop g1. Uh, there's also the move g4, but this leads to white's king getting marched out, and this is not going to end well for white. For instance, queen h1, king g3, and I think bishop e1 check should do the trick, among other moves, forcing bishop f2, queen here check, king up, yeah, and it's going to be a swift checkmate. Not even sure that was the most efficient checkmate, but that's just an example. So after queen to d1, Crush played the move bishop to g1. And here, I saw that I had a nice little resource that kind of improves upon the previous variation. So I played queen f3. My queen took an unusual route to this square, it kind of triangulated its way there to d1 and then to f3 as opposed to going to f3 immediately. But the effect of this move, queen d1, is that we've lured the bishop onto a square that will block the white queen. And white resigned because queen f1, while still defending g2, would now run afoul of queen h1. Note that the bishop is blocking the queen from defending that square. So in my mind, this illustrates not only the importance of changing the move order, as we discussed in the previous episode of chess cognition, but also in thinking backwards. So. In looking at queen f3 immediately, I picked up a valuable piece of information. And that piece of information is that white's queen is optimally placed on f1 because it can defend both squares. However, if I can block the queen from defending both squares and decoy a piece to interfere with the white queen, aka getting the white bishop to g1, then queen f3 is working great and black wins. Uh, also note here that white has a check on the back rank that is harmless because if they play queen c8, I can just escape to h7, and white has to come to grips with the mate threats, to which there's no answer. So when you're calculating, try to get used to uh, thinking backwards and trying to glean information from lines that you've previously examined. 
So if you were to simply look at queen f3, see queen f1, and then discard the idea altogether, you're not going to be calculating very efficiently. A good player will try to learn something from the defense that was employed by white, which is queen f1, and use that information to improve on the line and hopefully find the move queen d1, which wins. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this example. I'll be posting a PGN on chess.com. Thank you guys for watching. Bye.